Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, I would like to know if um, how many of you speak English or Spanish, so the presentation maybe will be done on English or Spanish, or I don't know, English? Okay, okay. perfect. Thank you very much. Um, this panel, we'll we are going to be talking about freedom of expression of internet in internet. Um, taking into account the case, the Peruvian case. Right now, uh, well, like from four, five years ago, we have uh, political unrest, and this deal to have some issues with freedom of speech on the internet. And we are gonna be talking about uh, the prosecutor of the crime of terrorism apology through ICT in Peru, in this case. Um, I think that we need a little of historical context when we are going to be talking about this. During the 1980s, Peru experienced an internal armed conflict primarily instigated by the terrorist group called Shining Path, but also involving the revolutionary movement known as Tupac Amaru. This group, Shining Path, initiated an armed uprising against the Peruvian state with the aim of overthrowing the exist existing legal and constitutional order at that time. Uh, Shining Path, this terrorist group, defined, had a defined ideology, identifying themselves as Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, and their leader, Abim Abimael Guzman, considered himself the fourth sword of Mar Marxism, adding the Gonzalo thought to these three ideologies. But in reality, far from bringing a guerrilla movement seeking to promote a proletarian revolution, this indeed was a terrorist group uh, and this group committed numerous human rights violations and attacks not only against against Peruvian state but also against unarmed civilian populations. They particular they particularly target indigenous and native and native communities. Shining Path had a deeply racist ideology and aimed to exterminate the Andean and Amazonian indigenous indigenous people, viewing them as obstacles to Peru Peru's historical development. Throughout this internal conflict experienced by the Peruvian state, there were numerous human rights violations, not only uh, done by this terrorist movement called Shining Path, but also done by the Peruvian government itself. Uh, Ayacucho was the uh, region that uh, suffered the most and was the most affected by, by this terrorist group and also by this violence caused by the Peruvian state. Example of this includes the um, Lucanamarca and Soras massacres perpetrated by Shannon Pat, but also a Comarca massacre carried out by Peruvian state. The truth is that this, pe this period in Peruvian history led to a significant loss of life. And it came. Okay. Yeah, uh, a significant loss of life and led to. Um, a loss of a uh, uh, thousand of lives that we haven't seen in recent history nowadays. In order to uh, combat these terrorist actions in Peru, uh, our criminal code um, typified this uh, type of crimes. And it had, uh, when we talk about terrorist offenses in Peru, it has two, four elements. One, uh, it requires that anyone who incites, creates, or maintains a step of anxiety, alarm, or fear in the population, two, engages in acts against life, body, health, personal freedom, and security, uh, public building, roads, all of that. Uh, three, it needs to be used firearms, material, explosive device, and any other means. And four, uh, it needs to be capable of causing um, havoc or serious disruption of public peace and uh, or affect international relationships. But recently, in 2017, uh, the, cri the crime of terrorism apology was recently put in our uh, criminal code. And it said that uh, if the exaltation, justification, or glorification is made uh, for the crime of terrorism or, uh, or any of this form or anyone that has been convicted by final judgment as author or participant of this crime, uh, it says that uh, there, uh, the person should be punished with no less than four years or than eight years in prison. But when this exaltation, justification, or glorification 
is done through ICTs, like we can say Facebook, Twitter, uh, I don't know, SMS or anything that comes through technology, the penalty shall be no less than eight years nor more than 15 years. So we can see here that if you commit the crime of terrorist apology through ICT, your punishment will be far bigger than the one if you do it on like a gnome in a public square. Uh, in, the, in the second, in the first case, you're going to have a penalty of no less than eight years, and in the second case, you're going to have only a penalty of four years. So when we talk about uh, terrorist apology and all the crimes related to freedom of speech, there are some jurisprudential and human rights criteria developed by our um, uh, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights that is, ne is needed to be taken into account when we talk about terrorism apology. In, indeed, in the report uh, on human rights made by the Inter-American Commission on hu Human Rights, it said that uh, for this offense to be compatible with freedom of expression in the Inter-American system, it must, it must at minimum inc incitate violence or similar actions and to have a likel likelihood of success. So it's not accorded to our Inter-American uh, Convention to punish uh, um, a terrorism apology just only by saying so, but you must incitate violence and also this incitation needs to be a likelihood to succeed. And also it establishes a set of criteria uh, in order to apply the penalties for the offense. When the judging, uh, when the judge, when the judge is applying this penalty, it needs to take into account some certain kinds of criteria. For example, the context of the situation, if it's done um, through the middle of the um, conflict, uh, also it needs to take into account the position of the individuals that make the expression and their liver or influence in society. It's not the same uh, common civil uh, doing uh, committing this crime or is been doing by a politician or maybe for a military chief. It's also needed to be taken into account the harm caused or, or that or that could be caused. And it comes together with the, with the minimum sets uh, explained before. Uh, in order to sanction this crime, er you need to incitate violence and a likelihood of succeed. And when this happens, you have to take into account how many harm this cause, the, this caused. Um, another criteria is the utility of the information given. Like it's not the same. Like um, I don't know, viva, uh, viva Presidente Gonzalo, that giving some information exactly about what did he, what did he done, what what have he done, or what all the shining paths have done, and the type of communication medium used. But in the case of Peru, uh, the Peruvian Constitutional Court, when, take, when have uh, taken into its court uh, a case related to uh, terrorism apology, it said that the medium used must be capable of, uh, of achieving pu publicity, spreading praise to an undetermined no number of people. And also that the exaltation affects the democratic principles of plurality, tolerance, and the search of consensus. But, and this is very important, uh, the Peruvian Constitutional Court uh, says that it is not needed to, uh, to have an actual danger. The, uh, the, cons the Peruvian Constitutional Court interpreted that it, in order to punish this crime and what it, it, it seeks, this, this crime seeks, is the potential danger, dangerous behavior, that rather than a specific harm or a legal interest. So in the Peruvian case, there is no need to do to apologize uh, the, the terrorism crime, but and couldn't um, and be able to cause to cause actual damage. Only is needed to, um, I don't know. Uh, just to say to praise the uh, terrorist uh, person and you will be punished by doing that. And also addresses the need to develop uh, criminal police policy in response to our reality. So there is, in the Peruvian case, we have uh, like these two differences. Uh, the Inter-American Commission says that in order to this crime to be compatible with the human rights, uh, Inter-American Human Rights Convention, it needs to have 
uh, potential and actual danger to human lives or public goods. But for the Constitutional Court, uh, it is not needed. You only because it only punishes a general potential danger behavior, not uh, the danger itself. So here we have our our first. Um, we we can find on the Peruvian legislation uh, uh, that when we talk about freedom of speech, like the Peruvian parameters are not in accordance with the inter-American parameters in this matter. And also, uh, when we talk about um, freedom of speech parameters on human rights parameters in general, um, we have the joint declaration on the independence and diversity of media in the digital age of 2018 issued by the spe Special Reportees of freedom of, fr freedom of Expression. And what, and what did it state? It, state? it said that states must refrain from enacting unnecessary or disproportionate laws that penalize or impose harsher sanctions on online expression compared to its offline equivalent. It means that when, um, when states um, criminalize some action, they must avoid just because just because it's done online to have um, more strict uh, penalties or higher penalties uh, uh, rather than is done um, I don't know in, in real life we could say so we can say here that also Peruvian legislation is not in accordance to to these human rights parameters because it's a like if you do apology of terror of terrorism in a, in a street or in a public square you only be sanctioned for four years, but if you don't, if you do it through internet, you're gonna have a eight years of penalty, be without taking taking into account any that could any spe specific feature that could that could happen in this situation. No. So, what we see that there are some issues with application of terrorism apology through ICT uh, established in, in our criminal code. First it can uh, violate the right to equality. Why? Because if someone commits this crime in a public square, he, only, he will be punished with four years of prison. But if I do the same uh, through internet, I don't know, through I have an Instagram account with one follower and no one sees, I do the uh, terrorism apology, I will be punished for eight years. So uh, is this, difference on the treatment of this uh, of this crime uh, is res reasonable why is this done so um, there's a bit uh, uh, first problem here of equality um, same actions are not treated the same even uh, though uh, isn't taking into account how this could damage effectively also the broad definition of what constitutes ICT um, uh, is also a very big problem. Uh, why? Because ICT con can be committed to what we understand as ICT. It could be SMS, it could be an email, it could be um, uh, WhatsApp, it could be Telegram. So in order to prosecute this type of crimes, we could say that police or prosecutors will be entitled to, um, to access to private communications only because uh, is uh, this uh, terrorism apology is done through ICT and at this point we call uh, we can have a reflection about if I I don't know I've, if I have a private communication with a friend and I don't know we are talking about it and my friend it's I don't know it uh, supports what shiny path done um, when uh, as long as he supports what Shiny Path has done, and if does it through WhatsApp messaging or through SMS, it will be uh, it will be possible to be punished with the, um, through the prosecutor. So there's also an issue, a very big problem here related to privacy and in the communications, and also. Uh, this type of crime doesn't take into account the diversity of platforms that we have uh, right now on the internet because it's not the same uh, uh, publishing or sharing some information on LinkedIn or on Facebook or in Twitter or, or in Instagram or whether we have a public account or more a private account. So this is a big problem here. 
Also because it doesn't take into account that um, platforms themselves uh, ha has mo moderation systems that could lead to um, take down content before it spreads all around. For example, let's say that someone committed the crime of apology through Facebook and because it's related to some kind of viol violence or terrorist, terrorist group, um, the Facebook moderation system uh, take it down, Ta takes, that content, to, uh, takes that content down. So here we are going to be ha having a trouble. Uh, prosecutors will be able to punish these type of actions even though the content didn't get to anybody because Facebook took it down. So um, this broad definition could also let, let, uh, let the prosecutor to punish some uh, tourism apology that haven't, uh, uh, that haven't took anyone to know what was we're talking about it. So uh, like the, this is like the general legal and jurisprudential um, meanings of we have about this uh, crime. So how was the crime has been pursued in, pact in practice? At Hiperderecho, we have done some research about how actual prosecutors and how actual judges were uh, judging this type of crimes, uh, terrorism apology through ICT. Um, here we have a study, t a study uh, of how uh, the number of reports of ICT terrorism apology filled to the public prosecutor's office. We can see that um, from 2019 to 2022, it doubled by a lot inside the 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 account of uh, reports of ICT terrorism filled to the public prosecutor and for 2023 on June it was uh, at around one 100 reports what it's also worrying about this this uh, pros uh, the prosecutor of this crime is um, as you know on December of past year we have a uh, social unrest in Peru this led to the Ministry of Interior to uh, to have this um, to post this on its social media, uh, telling people to report if they see like some kind of terrorist apology through internet. They tell people to report, and they say that you could report these type of crimes to a specific uh, email account, and. Uh, this email account that people could report the, this uh, terrorism apology was this, uh, the, the one we can find here. And, we and what happened? We asked to information about this uh, email account and the account uh, and the number of reports that it, it received. 96% uh, were dismissed and actual, actual cases that, that prosecutors have in their desk are like 2% of the cases. And what and why is this worrying? Why uh, one will ask why the Ministry of Interior uh, wanted to prosecute more this uh, uh, this this crime through internet? And what what happened on December of the past year on January? Most of the people that were protesting were uh, marked by the government as terrorists, and uh, without being actually terrorists, there was just people that were protesting, but government uh, said that they were terrorists. And what happened is that everybody was that was against the, the Peruvian government was marked a terrorist and were prosecuted. In this case, uh, we uh, we have one case study. We c we were gonna tell the the person that was uh, with uh, committed with, with this crime, Rodolfo. He was a student, uh, 22 years old. What happened in in this case is very important. Uh, why? Because uh, when we when when we read the uh, the judge uh, resolution, the judge resolution, we can say uh, that we can see that the its um, Facebook account is uh, actually is it's it's accessible. Any ed anybody could could get this Facebook account. And what we could f see is that this person that is being committed with this crime, um, he was on the far. He was a far-right uh, person, uh, militant. So all of his posts was related to far-right or right uh, ideology. 
and in his defense he said that his account has been hacked that he didn't actually post uh, the 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 publication that has uh, led him to have eight years of effective imprisonment and uh, what the prosecutor uh, did in order to uh, to ensure that he was the p the one that uh, re that actually have done this kind of of post he do some and uh, anthropology research and have done that uh, and said that as long as the people the one that appears in the facebook profile the the facebook photo profile is the same as the one that is seated here in the court is the same uh, we can say that uh, he committed the crime that was the form that the prosecutor said that he indeed committed the crime and after uh, all of that uh, the, the verdict was that he received eight years of e effective imprisonment and like uh, two thousand two thousand dollars in civil reparations we can see here that this was the post that was um, shared by this person in its account and what we can see is the he shared information about a facebook uh, page that is called bandera roja we can say it. He didn't write the post himself. He uh, the account the, the account shared that information. That uh, we can say that um, uh, yeah, it's committing apology of uh, the terrorist group and the terrorist person, Abimel uh, Guzman. But uh, the defense uh, said that he didn't post it, and we can ask why the attorney or the prosecutor didn't judge or didn't seek or didn't. Uh, make uh, uh, take into trial uh, or try to investigate who was behind this Facebook page, Pandera Roja. If he didn't do it, so uh, nor we have even though we having all this information, this lack of uh, judicial uh, reason, we have this period of, of eight years of effective prison. So we. Uh, Right now, we don't know effectively if this person um, indeed committed the crime, but he right now is in prison for eight years. Um, when we talk uh, digital apology, um, so how is the judicial reasoning here? There is a lack of account ownership verification in this process. Uh, the unlawful, un unlawful conduct that is being sanctioned here is the praising terrorist leaders and questioning and, criti and criticizing their trials. What led this person and what this post says is that that criticized the trial that come into account for Abimel Guzman. Um, uh, if it's done through social media, simply posting or sharing content is an effective way to spread praise. Uh, doesn't, doesn't matter if you indeed wrote it or you just share it, maybe you could share it uh, not on purpose, by mistake, it will be also be uh, prosecuted by this crime. And uh, civil when we talk about civil reparation, um, there is we, we've, re we've reviewed four or five uh, judges in this case, um, the judicial cases, and the there was the same amount in all, in all these five sentences, the amount was the same, like uh, approximately two thousand dollars, but there is no further anali analysis is conducted beyond confirming non-material harm. So why do ask for two thousand dollars civil reparation um, without analyzing if I don't know the post on Facebook caused more harm uh, through uh, or caused more harm rather than posting in on Instagram or posting posting in through X? We don't know. In all the cases, it had a uh, $2,000 reparation without taking, without taking into account these uh, specific matters. So at this point, we ask the persecution of this, of the, um, are we against a persecution of dissent and infringement of freedom of expression of internet? Uh, we know because of the social unrest that happened in Peru on December or January, uh, presi uh, President Boluarte said that the people that were protesting were marked as terrorists. Also, uh, most of one of the most uh, influential congressmen said that all the people that are protested are are terrorists. So we have this problem here. 
If you say that everyone that is protested, protesting against the government is called terrorist, and also anyone can report anything, any type, any type of criticism through the government done by social media, and you can report it to this specific e email, well, what we are going to have is people no more is going to criticize the government through internet. So uh, there's we can see is what police indeed investigates in these cases and is the problem that we have uh, uh, at the per derecho we have found here. Actual legislation that we have on uh, terrorism apology doesn't respect human rights standards and it's so wide open that everyone could be uh, prosecuted by this crime and um, it instigates to people that no more we that can never to not be more critical about Peruvian government of no more. So um, that's what what that's what I want to share with you. And here Camila is gonna have some comments about what is um, happening in Brazil that we what we can uh, take into account when we talk about uh, terrorism on ICT. Thank you, Dilmar. Thank you for for the invitation also uh, i have read your article about these issues and uh, it's important to have this uh, this kind of balance of different rights when we are talking about this because it's complex we have to consider the concrete case and what we see is that we, we don't have like the silver bullet solution but what is being applied is not is definitely not not the best option so we are trying to balance uh, the protection of the state the democratic and uh, the, the democracy the freedom of expression and each jurisdiction have a different way to balance it but it's important that you brought some inter-american parameters to do this so we have some parameters that have to be followed and they are not being followed in Brazil, we also have this anti-terrorism law. It's applied a little different because um, it's about exposing uh, someone to uh, to a danger, to to the peace, uh, to the public safety. But in cyber crimes, we don't have any specific uh, amount. Uh, you don't have a specific sanction for cyber crimes. Uh, it's a range, so you can you can be convicted for an imprisonment of twelve to 30 years, and when it, I when it is committed through cybercrime, the judge sees uh, concretely how much is the imprisonment. This brings a challenge, too, of legal uncertainty. So if it's not in the law, the judge can also apply something that might be not that... Um, not not considering that much the specific case, but it has to be considered. So we have two two opposite sides, too strict on that, but also too broad on that. So when we are talking about this beyond enhancing legislation, we also have to think on how we can qualify better the judges that are applying this kind of law. But I to end, I would just uh, like to to talk a little about the Brazilian context because beyond of the law, we had uh, recently some cases of. Um, we had like a capital invasion in Brazil in January. Uh, it was 8 January and these, uh, these people are, are being uh, sued also for uh, att attacks against the democratic state and also terrorism. We have a challenge on that, on how we deal with that and how also the judges uh, try to um, make the responsabilization of these people by assessing their communications, how do they prove that, and this is a challenge. This is one side. In the other side, that is also a consequence of this context, we have um, a platform regulation bill in Brazil. It's similar to the DSA, which is the Digital Services Act, is related to content moderation, to uh, uh, responsabilization of platforms, to transparency, but we have two, uh, two main dispositions that are important. The first one is duty of care, and the second one is the um, uh, how can I say the safety this uh, the safety measure uh, when you have uh, an imminent danger? The duty of care has to consider uh, has to make platforms uh, diligent uh, and mitigate illicit practices within the scope of their services, making an effort to improve uh, the to combat the dissemination of illegal content generated by third parties and this diligence also includes terrorism. From one side, duty of care is important for platforms, but in the other side, 
how to do that concretely? Do the platforms have the power to say what is terrorism and what is not? This is one challenge. And the other challenge is that they, mi they might be responsabilized, uh, like a civil liability, when there is a specific case of imminent danger. So this, um, this uh, well, it's not a law, it's a bill that we are contributing also in EDAC, in uh, Digital Rights Network, in Brazil, Coalizão Direitos na Rede, and it's a challenge. How can we balance on this? Because we, uh, from one side, people want to, uh, want to uh, make the, these people uh, liable for their action, but on the other side, we cannot be uh, extremely surveillant. We, we, we cannot have surveillance. We have to consider uh, the rights and how to balance it. I know that I didn't give answers, but it's great to hear from, from the Peruvian reality and also to understand in Brazil and how we can compare them both. But it's a challenge that we have to, to face in practice. So to be fast, that, that's my contribution. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Camille. And, and what we can think about is, is when we talk about terrorism, it's very, it's very dangerous to have a wide definition of it because uh, it can lead us to uh, suppress uh, um, critical point of views. And when we talk about freedom of expression, we have to be very careful about what type of a speech can be suppressed or what kind of uh, speech cannot be suppressed. So uh, in the Peruvian case, we can see that effectively, effectively some kind of a speech and the speech against government is being suppressed right now. And what I can say is most of the times we can think that uh, re legislation or regulation is needed because, I don't know, there is a certain attack to against one politician and these people is, is a terrorist, but it's also needed um, a specific definition of what is terrorism. And when we talk about uh, terrorism apology also, it's needed to, it's more difficult because we are not talking about actions that constitute terrorism, but uh, a kind of uh, certain type of speech. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, Camila. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so I don't know if you have any questions here or, mm -hmm. or uh, because the, uh, the panel is sending right now, if you have any, if we have any questions, we can, uh, talk uh, outside and thank you very much for being here.